There's a lot of different tendon sheaths that are going to encircle a tendon as it goes through. Okay? So when your hands, these tendons are moving your the hands to move the fingers, the tendons are going through different sheaths. Okay? So it's not actually in the actual joint cavity per se, but it's related to the synovial joints. Is it possible for the fluids, like the synovial fluid, to leave out of the joint? Not normally. I mean, you can have a rupture. There's something that you, uh, you may talk about, like a Baker cyst on the back of the knee, where you can have maybe like a herniation of the joint capsule where it kind of bulges out. But the snowmelt membrane is pretty tough. It's got a fibrous outer layer, so it doesn't normally rupture, but it can happen. I mean, you can do like an arthrogram where they'll put uh, a dye into the joint cavity, synovial cavity in the shoulder and see if it leaks out, or they can do that in the knee. Do you have why, why have I heard of someone like taking a needle and, and taking out some of the Aspirating fluid, yeah. yeah. If you have a swelling, then oh, they may do yeah, that to take right. out. If you have trauma, you know, if the knee's all swollen up. Um, you can also have it if, if, it's, if it's in a bursa. The bursa is enlarged. That's not contiguous with the synovial cavity, but it's another type of fluid like you'll see you know, have a left number side where you have a big fall on here. Sometimes they can aspirate it right now. So if there's excess fluid, they may aspirate it. And if you have a bad enough injury, you can tear the joint capsule, but usually it's fairly strong when it stays contained. And then we'll talk about the stability of joints. Okay. So you mentioned that, like, stay on the shoulder. So here's, this is a model of the, let's see, which hand is it? It's the right arm like this, okay? So here's your hinge joint, right? Okay? So this, here's the ball and socket joint for the shoulder, but this is the, the labrum, okay? It's not a very deep socket, okay? So your shoulder is a lot more mobile than your hip, okay? So I didn't make a leg bone yet. So here's your hip ball and socket. And your acetabulum is a lot deeper socket than the other one. So this is a lot more stable joint than your hip. Because you can move your shoulder a lot more than you can turn around your hip. You know, you're a ballerina or something like that, right? So there's going to be ligaments that are going to hold that joint in together. And then also, in, the, in terms of the shoulder, there's a rotator cuff. Okay, so you have muscles that hold it in. So the more, if, if there's a shallower socket or if the stability doesn't come from the joint, then it has to come from ligaments and muscles. Because the shape of the articular surfaces of the joint is what's going to determine how much stability comes from that, the joint itself. So you can see if this, this glenoid labrum is not very deep, so it's, it's not stable, that ball and socket can slip out pretty easily. As you see, you see a lot more shoulder dislocations than you have hip dislocations. Um, so if somebody is like big flexible, if they're double jointed, does that mean that it's just looser and they can like, is that why they can? Yeah, it's not like they have two joints in them, but basically they they have overall laxity of the ligaments. Oh. And typically, in you know, in kids, they're going to be more flexible. Muscles and tendons are going to stretch easier. But some people are going to have overall more ligament laxity. But that's something that you can help. Like if we went back to that first picture where the yogi guy is doing that. I can't do that. But if you practice that enough, you know, you see those yogis that squeeze into a little box, right? <laughs> They've developed over years and years of stretching all their ligaments and things like that. Uh, so then, but the thing in the, in the shoulder, because this uh, joint, the bony surface is not that deep, there is another thing like a, there's a labrum that's another dip thing that adds more to the lip. It kind of builds up onto the lip of that. Okay. And then it's, it's sort of like the meniscus in the knee. There's a meniscus that adds a little bit more concavity to the joint surface. So, the, when we talk about the ligaments that support the joint, they can either be part of the capsule. 
that surrounds the whole joint. Uh, like in the shoulder, the, the shoulder joint capsule has thickenings that are certain named ligaments, but it's still contiguous with the capsule that goes all the way around. Whereas in the knee, you have separate ligaments that are separate from the joint capsule. You have the two cruciates that cross in the knee, and then you have the collateral ligaments, and those are outside of the joint capsule. And then the other thing that helps to hold, hold joints together or add to joint stability is going to be muscle tone. So that's important, like in the shoulder, right? I just heard about the rotator cuff. Right? So the, the shoulder stability doesn't come from the structure of the joint itself, because the joint, the glenoid fossa, is not very deep. And it does have a labrum that goes around the outside, but it's still mobile. And then what helps to hold that in is the muscles of the shoulder, uh, especially the rotator cuff help to hold that humerus into the socket when you're moving it around. So this is basically, this is out of the book, okay? And it goes through all the different joints and talks about the different classifications of them, right? So we'll talk about the, the types of joints, what bones articulate together, what type of structural classification it is, and then the functional or the classification. Okay, so we're going to go through some of these, but this is something you can you, know, you need to study and look over in the book and kind of learn, you know, which go through each different joint and know what type of joint is it. Is it a pivot joint? Is it a hinge joint? They have the chromoclavicular. Because in the shoulder, there's more than one joint. And there's the glenohumeral joint, which is the primary joint, which also have the AC joint, or the chromoclavicular, and other joints. And then you go through the lower extremity. So again, these are pretty much all going to be synovial joints, except, like I mentioned here, this tibiofibular. So that's the synarthrotic joint. But most of these you can see are going to be diarthrotic, except for, like we mentioned before, the pubic symphysis. Okay, that's a cartilaginous joint. So then this we mentioned before, the bursa is going to be a flattened fiber sac that's filled with fluid. It's outside of the joint capsule, but it's there to reduce friction. Like, has anybody heard of iliotibial band bursitis, right, or iliotibial band syndrome? That's the iliotibial band is part of a muscle ligament complex or muscle tendon complex that goes on the side of the knee, and there's a bursa that when the, ten, the band snaps across, you get irritation of the bursa. Because it's usually going to be around joints where there's bony prominences, or you have some in the hip, have some in the elbow, around the shoulder. So here's an example of, of a bursa sac right, where it's underneath the tendon here. So it helps to, as that tendon, those things are moving, it helps eliminate friction. And then like I mentioned, certain articular surfaces have a more inherent stability built into them versus others. Like we talked about the the knee has a lot more contours, and when you add the meniscus to it, it has more stability, whereas the shoulder doesn't have much of the socket, it's not very deep. And then the ligaments are going to help to increase that stability. And then muscles are going to help support the stability of the joints. So now we'll talk about the different types of synovial joints. So again, at this point now we're talking about diarthrodial joints, synovial joints. So they're all going to have cartilage surfaces, they're all going to have synovial membranes. So you have a plane joint, which is just two surfaces articulating, articulating with each other, okay? two flat surfaces, and that's going to be like in the carpal joints. And that's what's called a non-axial joint. So you don't have an axis of movement, and you'll see when we talk more about the other joints, they'll all have an axis of movement. So plane joints are just sliding. Okay, so they're moving in a single plane. 